from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the chair of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards Program and of the Library's Center for the Book. I wanted you to know that this morning we had meetings of a conference meeting of the Library of Congress Literacy Board and other literacy experts. And among other things, we discussed the importance of best practices that are being established in the literacy field, part through our awards program. Uh, we are in the process of publishing a booklet of best practices, uh, which will be made generally available as a way of expanding the range of our program and what we want. And that publication will soon be available on the Library of Congress's reading promotion website called read.gov. But this afternoon, we are here to honor the first recipients of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards and to hear from two of our board members, David Baldacci and James Patterson, both distinguished writers and literacy advocates, and having them involved on the 20-person board for the Library of Congress Literacy Awards uh, gives this award a new dimension, a public dimension, that we agreed at our meeting this morning is quite important, that we are trying to point out that we at the Library of Congress in developing this award through the, the benefactor of uh, David, our benefactor, David Rubenstein, who sadly could not be with us today, uh, we are creating something that cuts across literacy in all its forms and cuts across academia, schools, libraries, uh, both adult literacy, kids' literacy, and are creating a five-year program that has a public dimension as well, which is one reason we're pleased to have this as a public event. To get us started, let me please join me in welcoming the Librarian of Congress, James H. Billington. Dr. Billington, along with our benefactor, James uh, David Rubenstein, uh, has been a motivating force behind our awards program. He has been Librarian of Congress since 1987 when President Ronald Reagan appointed him and the U.S. Senate unanimously confirmed his nomination. Please give Dr. James Billington a hand. Thank you very much, and uh, let me just uh, reinforce the welcome here. Uh, because this is, uh, today, a thanks to John, his colleagues, and the wonderful group of advisors, we have a very special day in the history of the Library of Congress. We'll be recognizing the first recipients of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards. Now, these awards are made possible, as John Cole told you, through the generosity of David M. Rubenstein, co-founder of the Carlyle Group, and a philanthropist who suggested to me that the library might consider adding to the visibility of those who have been involved in promoting literacy, including the library itself. David, who is also the major donor to the Library of Congress National Book Festival, cannot be with us today, as John has already mentioned, but I know he joins me in congratulating everyone who advised us, those who applied, and those who we will especially honor this afternoon, and indeed the whole enterprise of trying to use this process to give more visibility to the most fundamental first ladder on the rung of learning, being able to read so that you can move on to a full life and a healthy society. Here to introduce um, some very special guests who will open the proceedings this afternoon, and whose names uh, John has already mentioned, uh, distinguished writers of great concern 
for this cause as well. Is Roberta Schaefer, the library's associate librarian for library services. Roberta has played a major role in overseeing the progress administration of these awards. Before becoming associate librarian, she was in charge of the program that the Library of Congress runs for other federal libraries, purchasing and so forth. She was the Law Librarian of Congress, among many other important roles. She's also had oversight of the library's annual National Book Festival, which, as you know, attracts in the last, in recent years, for its two-day proceedings in late September, um, participants over 200,000 for the last few years for the two-day event itself. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Roberta Schaefer. I hate to start such a fabulous event with a gripe, but I want to uh, say that I have a gripe with the New York Times from this morning's headline on the editorial page. It says, from baby Einstein to baby Austin. And I read that this morning and I thought, no, from baby Einstein to baby Baldacci, that's the right way. <laughs> After all, had Jane Austen um, written 26 novels um, in such a short period of time, one of which was about the Library of Congress, actually, in which the rare book librarian is murdered. <laughs> um, had she sold over a million volumes, translated into 45 languages, distributed in 80 countries? I don't think so, not by, not by that time. Did she share uh, Virginia roots with one of the founders of the Library of Congress, Thomas Jefferson? She wasn't a graduate of the esteemed law school at the University of Virginia. And um, she had not been, to the best of my knowledge, a tireless advocate in her lifetime, although I know she has played a huge part in reading and the enjoyment of it in her legacy, but she had not been such a vocal and active advocate for reading and literacy. Uh, David, along with his wife, Michelle, who could not be with us today, and we're really missing her, so please express our uh, best to her, founded the Wish You Well Foundation, which supports family and adult literacy in the United States. And it pr promotes literacy um, of all kinds and particularly focuses on educational programs. In 2008, the foundation partnered with Feeding America to launch Feeding Body and Mind, or Feeding and Reading, I guess. And this is a program that tries to address the connection between overcoming illiteracy, poverty, and hunger. And through this program, more than one million new and used books have been collected and distributed through the mechanism of food banks across the country. David is also a familiar face at the Library of Congress and a wonderful supporter of this institution, and we are incredibly grateful, although we do need to talk to you about murdering our rare book librarian. <laughs> he has participated in our uh, National Book Festival five times, and he sits on the uh, National Book Festival's advisory board and, as you know, is on the board of advisors for this award. So he gives us an awful lot of time and attention to which we are incredibly grateful. He has received a number of um, writing awards and was inducted into the International Crime Writers Hall of Fame and was also the Barnes & Noble um, winner of the Writers Award. Now, one of his very, very well-known books that you may be familiar with because you've either read it or you might have seen the film version is Absolute Power. And in fictional life, um, Absolute Power relates to uh, a lot of political and personal intrigue and power as a corrupter. But in real life, Absolute Power, I think, comes from the ability to read because then you have the ability through your mind to travel and go anywhere, and that is something that is absolutely in your control and gives you incredible power. And so with that, it is my absolute pleasure to ask David to come to the podium. Thank you very much.
Well, I would like to say right away that I'm a big Jane Austen fan. <laughs> Probably the biggest in the world, absolutely. I'm, I'm her number one. If she were here, she would know that. <laughs> Roberta, thank you so much. It was great. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking David Rubenstein. I mean, for all of his good work and stewardship, I don't think the Library of Congress could have a better partner than this man. He is everywhere and does everything, and his help and assistance and guidance is just exemplary. James Billington, you have ably led this library into the 21st century and done a wonderful job. I hope you never retire. And my good friend John Cole, who's the head of the Center for the Book, and his mission is to stimulate public interest in books and reading. What could be better than that? My plan today is to sort of tell a few stories from the road and then get into more serious matters of why we're actually here. Now, in a couple of weeks, I had out on book tour. Um, and on book tour, you get a lot of questions from fans. Where do you get your ideas, yada, yada. And, uh, but the one question I get more than any other is, what is it like to be a number one best-selling writer? And I know the way they ask the question, they really want some sort of Hollywood glitzy glam answer. Like I get up at noon every day, you know, and I have a smoking jacket I put on, I have a small furry animal I carry under my arm, and I go down to my little study where a bunch of people are waiting to write down everything that I say. That's not my life at all. Usually when I come from back from book tour and I tell my wife I am home, she goes, great, you know, it's trash day, get on it. But the question I get more than any other is, what is it like to be a best-selling writer? So in answer, I tell them a true story about my kids. Now, my kids are grown now, but when they were little, I took my daughter to a book signing with me for the first time. Maybe she was five. We walked in, saw all the people, and this woman came over from the bookstore and introduced herself, and, and she said, do you know why people are here? Uh, and my daughter said, yes, I do know. They're here to see my dad. Do you know why? They want my dad to sign their book. Do you know why they want your dad to sign their book? Yes, I do know. They want my dad to sign their book because he has the nicest handwriting. <laughs> and she's in college now, and I still think she believes that, actually. Now, she must have passed his wisdom on to her little brother. The first time I took my son to a bookstore, he was about three. We walked in. And he's also been all, always kind of a little entrepreneur anyway. So we walked in, and he see all the people and all the books, and his eyes got huge. And he, he started running across the bookstore at the top of his speed, screaming at the top of his lungs, my daddy will sign any book you've got for $2. <laughs> um, people also ask, do you get recognized a lot in public? No, you really don't as a writer. It's sort of this nice anonymous celebrity. But occasionally you do get recognized. But even when you do, it's not sort of the ego stroke that you otherwise think it might be. The last time I was recognized in public, I was having lunch with my wife. Some place, we were in a booth, and I would look up occasionally and look across the restaurant, and there was this woman across the way who was sitting with, I assumed, her husband having a lunch, and every time I looked up, she was like lasered on me, boom, you know, and this happened like five or six times until I finally just got so scared, I stopped looking up, I was just focusing on my chicken, right, and then I sensed a presence next to me, I thought it was the waiter, but then I looked over, it was her, so she pushed me over in the booth and sat down next to me. And she looked at me with sort of a coy smile, and she said, you are who I think you are, aren't you? That, that's a kind of a tough sentence, even to diagram, you know? I, I can't make heads nor tail of that. But um, I said, well, uh, do you read a lot of fiction? She said, oh, yes, I do. I said, OK, well, I guess I am who you think I am. She said, oh my god, I never thought this would happen. This is the greatest moment of my whole life. She turns and screams across the restaurant to her husband, and she said, I was right, Joe. It is John Grisham. <laughs> now, John and I are friends. I love John to death. You know, I've done events with John. He's a great man. That moment in my life, I really was not feeling the love for John at all. My poor wife, to put it delicately, she sort of, she sort of blew iced tea out of her nose. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever done that. Um, it's not as easy as it might look, actually. I knew that she had done it because most of it hit me in the chest. And uh, I looked at the, and she looked at the woman. She said, "You know, ma'am, that's the right genre, but the wrong author." And she looked mortified. And then she shot a glance at me again. She goes, "Oh my God, are you Baldacci?" And I said, yeah, I am. <laughs> so obviously terribly chagrined that I was not Monsieur Grisham, she turned and yelled across the restaurant again to her husband and said, you're right, Joe, it is the Italian. 
what an ego I must have. I mean, my head was so huge. Now, I do a lot of research for my novels. If you read them, hopefully you can see that. And I don't just write, you know, read books or go on Wikipedia. I don't like to do research that way. I like to sort of go out and see and do some of the things that I'm writing about in the book. Now, a few years ago, I had the idea to write a military investigator. My dad had been in the Navy, and a bunch of my uncles had been, but I really didn't know that world. So I had a good friend who was a lieutenant colonel, retired. He had been a ranger, which my character was going to be. So we jumped on a plane and flew down to Fort Benning in Georgia, uh, where the rangers train. And I spent three days down there. So we, as soon as we landed, the Army is great about schedules. So I was going to be there three days, and my itinerary was like 114 pages long. You know, Every like five minutes of my time at Fort Benning was allocated. The only thing they left out, they provided no time for me actually to eat. <laughs> which was unusual, but nevertheless. So we got there, and they immediately drove me to the parachute jumping grounds. And they have two towers at Fort Benning. One is a 212-foot tower, and you jump off with an actual parachute. The other one is a 40-foot high tower, and you jump out on the zip line thing. So they wouldn't let me jump off the tall one. Not that I would have anyway. So we went to this other one. Now, you have all these paratroopers on the ground. They, these guys jump out of planes, you know, like it's nothing. And so they're putting all this stuff on me, my helmet, these, ca these straps that the cable we attached to, are both my shoulders and my legs, and they're giving me pointers. And they said, look, when you jump out of there, you're going to fall at a rapid rate. Now, when you fall, if those cables, particularly around your legs, are not cinched back really tight, they're going to move, and they're going to hit a part of your anatomy you'll never forget. <laughs> so as I'm going up to the place to jump off, you can see me like cranking these cables back so tightly I had no blood flow in my lower extremities. So I went up to the top and there's a jump master up there and his job is sort of to tell you, okay, what's going to happen. And the first thing he said, well, are you afraid of heights? Now I have to tell you, when you're looking down at the ground and you're looking up four stories, it does not look that high. When you're up four stories and looking down, it looks like you're on top of the Empire State Building. It really does. It's just a different sort of illusion experience. And I said, well, I wasn't afraid of heights until I got up here. He said, okay, here's how it's going to go. Now, the best thing to do is, is to stand back at the end. They made this shack like a fuselage of a plane with a little cutout. You stand back there and get a running start and just run out and jump out into the open air. And even though I had cable attached, I couldn't see the zip line that was going to be supporting me. So it was like I was just jumping out into the open air with nothing really to hold me up. He said, now when you jump, jump as far away from the building as you can, and that way you won't drop as much. Um, and the second thing to remember is, keep your chin tucked tightly to your chest. I said, well, why is that? He said, otherwise the cable that's supporting you will come around and it'll take your ear right off. <laughs> so I was like, check that box off. Um, <laughs> chin to chest, not forgetting that one. Well. I have to admit that it took me a little bit of time to work up the courage to walk back to the far wall and get a running start and then jump out into the open air four stories up with nothing really I could see that was going to support me. And the last thing he told me as a piece of advice before I jumped was, now, when you jump, you're going to be ripped to the right because they're trying to simulate you jumping out of a plane, and you're going to go, be going at like a 45 or 50 degree angle fast to the, to the ground, really fast, and then there will be soldiers on the ground waiting to give you further instructions. And I said, while I'm in the air? He goes, yes, sir. So, about five minutes you know, to work up the courage to jump. And in the meantime, there was a betting pool going on down below with the paratroopers. And it was like 99 to 1, I was not going to jump. The only one who was betting in my favor was the guy I'd flown down with. And he was doing a video of this whole thing. And you could hear later on the videotape he showed me, one guy, one paratrooper on the ground was like, what the hell is taking him so long up there? Is he writing a book? So I finally said, okay, I got to do this. And I stood back, got a running start, jumped chin to chest. And I got to tell you, I felt that cable come around and like tweak my ear. And I'm flying straight down and I, you know, sort of open my eyes. And I'm heading right before like a five foot tall dirt berm, solid wall dirt berm. And my first thought was, what idiot put a dirt berm on the parachute jumping grounds? The next thing I realized is there are soldiers on the ground screaming at me, lift your feet, sir, lift your feet immediately. Those were the further instructions. <laughs> so I lifted my feet past my head 
and, uh, which is not easy to do when you're up in the air. And I cleared the dirt berm, and, and I didn't die, and they grabbed and stopped me. And for all of that, they gave me a little piece of paper that said, uh, Dear you from the United States Army, congratulations, you jumped. <laughs> now, sometimes research can get you into trouble. Um, I was on an Amtrak Acela train one time, and I was in D.C. heading to New York. And I was sitting at a table, I was sharing with a couple of guys I didn't know. I'm assuming they were businessmen because they had on, you know, suits and they had laptops and Blackberries and, and computers and miniature satellite towers on top of them. And they were just like oozing power. And I was on my cell phone and I was talking to a friend of mine who's a medical examiner in the Bronx medical examiner's office. And all I wanted to do was set up an appointment to see her face to face when I got to New York. She was sort of a recognized expert on this field that I needed to know more about for writing this novel. Unfortunately, she told me that she was leaving to go on special assignment overseas and actually be, would be flying out by the time I got to New York. She's going to be overseas for about three weeks, not in communication back stateside, so I could either talk to her now or wait until she got back. I really don't know wait until she got back. So I said, okay, Doc, let's, let's just do it. This is the only way we can do it. So I said, okay, here's basically how I want to murder the guy. <laughs> so I went through my very elaborate poisoning technique that I would given a lot of thought to, let me tell you. And I said, look, Doc, you have to understand that when the police investigate this murder, I, I need to make sure they won't even know this person has been killed by, by anyone. She goes, oh, they won't, David. It's a perfect crime. It really is. I said, now there's going to be a postmortem, someone like you that's going to you know, examine the body. I need to make sure I can convince that person that this person has not been murdered by anyone. She goes, absolutely, it's a perfect crime, I'm telling you. And she, in fact, she went on to say, I've often thought about murdering people. And if I were going to do it, I'd do it exactly the way you just described, because it was a perfect crime. So, you know, it was high praise coming from her. So I asked her a few more questions, and I signed off by saying, I've got to tell you, Doc, if I ever need to murder someone else, I'm going to call you. So then I clicked off, and I finished writing my notes, and I looked up. <laughs> now, the guy over here had spilled his coffee from his neck to his crotch. He was like one big brown stain. The guy right across from me was just staring at me, not saying anything, but looking at me just like this. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And over his shoulder, here come the Amtrak police. Up in that point in my life, I didn't know Amtrak had its own police. Um, they were very interested in me. Now, I did not make it to New York that day. I was detained as a person of interest by the Amtrak police, and I can tell you from personal experience, you never want to be detained as a person of interest by anyone. Now, the book that I was writing for all this was called Split Second, and the acknowledgement section you see at the end of that is a place where authors thank people who help them. The very last acknowledgement in that section goes something like this. To any and all passengers on the Amtrak Acela train, <laughs> who might have overheard me discussing poisoning techniques with an expert and were probably scared out of their wits at my seemingly diabolical intent, I apologize. <laughs> And I, I thought it was very fair of the judge to let me do it that way. <laughs> you see what writers sacrifice for their readers? Come on, I mean, um. Now, we come here today to honor innovative programs that encourage people to read, and I extend my congratulations to the nominees and the worthy award winners, I really do. I became involved in literacy about 15 years ago when I was on book tour. A lot of my book events were sponsored by Friends of the Library, library associations, because I got a real crash course in sort of the needs to combat illiteracy in this country through that. Now, across this great country, I saw much that was wonderful. I really did, it's a great country, but I also saw much that was disheartening. I'll just say it right now, we are the richest, most educated nation on earth, but only in certain discrete pockets. And other places, we're not anything close to that. Now, I'm a firm believer in rising waters lifts all boats. And to remain a great nation, we have to lift the opportunities for all, not just some. Now, getting people to read is a crucial part of that, particularly kids. But if their parents can't read, the chances are very, very low that neither were little children. And if a home has no books, what are the odds that a child will become a dedicated reader? Now, imagine your own life without the ability to read. I, I understand that I'm sort of preaching to the choir, but the message is so important that it's one that needs to be said over and over again. So imagine your own life without the ability to read. Well, a lot more Americans are having to do just that. Look, a quarter of our kids come out of high school without even a diploma. Socioeconomically, let's face it, they're doomed. They're absolutely doomed. 
17 of the largest 50 U.S. cities have high school graduation rates below 50 percent. We have a million dropouts a year in this country, a million of them. Nearly 100 million adults either read at the lowest level of literacy or are completely illiterate. 100 million adults in a nation that has a little over 200 million adults in it. Now, the Wish You Well Foundation, Roberta has talked to you some about what we do. We fund literacy organizations across the country. We funded programs in almost all the 50 states. A lot of them are small organizations, rely a lot on volunteers. We try to make them stronger by scrutinizing their financial records, and if we see they have a smaller donor base and they need to have more donors, we'll do a matching offer to them, but they have to go out and get new money from a brand new donor they don't already have on their rolls. We try to hook them up with other organizations across the country, networking, and trying to bring scarce resources together so that more can be accomplished with you know, resources that have been brought together rather than scattered all over the country. Feeding Body Mind came about because we would get organizations and literacy asking for a food component of the do donation. We need to feed people because this may be the only good meal they get when they come in to try to learn to read. So that's where we partnered with Feeding America and now we collect books and send them across the country to food banks. The idea being you need food to survive, certainly, but food alone will never get you out of the cycle of poverty. It's impossible. People are there because they have lower literacy skills, low reading skills. They may be illiterate. I've never seen a bad result from a book being at home, ever. I've seen many, many bad results being with no books being in a home. There's unfortunately no national comprehensive policy to combat illiteracy in this country. The majority of the work is done by small organizations with limited resources who rely a lot on volunteers. Now, I have been to Capitol Hill, right near here, to lobby on behalf of literacy. Everyone says they support it, of course, but it's like they assume our education system teaches everyone how to read well enough. And they point out that we have increasingly scarce resources that have to be directed into more advantageous arenas. More critically, and I've just really thought about this, more critically, we assume that education and the ability to read in this country is tied to the social matrix of the nation. That's a mistake because it grants it only second class status. Because of that view in bad economic times, which we certainly have been through, some of the first things cut are education, reading. We cut off our own future when we do that. Right now with programs like SNAP, food stamps, Head Start, Pre-K, which studies show are very successful in helping a large number of kids, a lot of at-risk kids, to learn better and lead productive lives, it's not a question of whether they'll be cut, it's how severely they will be cut. So the result will be poor kids will fall further behind, and that hole eventually gets so deep that you can never get out of it, no matter what your ambition might be. You can never get out of the hole. Early education is critical. Many studies show that if you can't read by third grade, your life is not going to turn out well. In essence, what happens between ages zero and nine will determine the remaining seven decades or so of your life. And listen, it's not like other countries are waiting for us to catch up. Last month, the results of a wide-ranging global study was released that looked at ages, people ages 16 to 64 in 24 mostly developed countries, including our own. They measured literacy, math skills, and problem-solving skills. The U.S. ranked near or at the bottom in each one of those. In literacy, only 12% of mostly older Americans could read at the highest level. Younger Americans scored at the very bottom of the 24 countries. Many places, such as Finland, which scored at the top, they don't tie education to the social matrix. They tie it to the economic viability of their country. Finland has made education and the well-being of all kids, regardless of their background, a top-level priority. Teachers are trained in specialized universities, and the profession is highly regarded. You know, I was really upset a few years ago when, in the middle of the economic crisis, people were sort of pointing at teachers' unions and lamenting the fact that teachers are paid outrageous amounts of money, like $25,000 a year, to teach, and they got the summer off. Could you believe that? You know, a television pundit who makes a million dollars spewing, I don't know what, says. In Finland, the best and the brightest want to be teachers. Can you imagine that? Long ago, the country of Taiwan realized the only natural resource they had were their people. They put everything in education and retraining, realizing that in the 21st century, knowledge and skills, not oil or gold, are the world's most valuable resources. The result, they lead the world in productivity and innovation. And despite having less than 5% of our population, Taiwan has the fourth largest financial reserves in the world. And the excuse that we're a lot bigger and more complex than Finland or Taiwan is, at the end of the day, let's face it, just an excuse. 
and it does nothing to solve the underlying problem. The key is, in many successful nations, education is seen as a national asset on the same level of importance as the military in securing the future of their country. Our military can defeat any other army on Earth. Why? It's incredibly well-funded, a top national priority, and there are officer schools dedicated to teaching men and women how to lead others in uniform. Education should be seen in the same category, but it's not in the U.S. and never has been. Yet I will always choose books over bombs, always. I get fired up about this, I'm sorry, but um, it really does all start with the ability to read, which is the same verb as the ability to think. If you think about it, you can't do one without the other. It's the most fundamental skill humans will ever have. It goes far beyond enjoying a good book or even a productive life. It's critical to the kind of world in which we should want to live. Now, ignorance and intolerance are history's great evil forces. You never find one without the other because they, all, they feed off of each other and they cause each other. People are afraid and distrustful of what they don't know. The more they don't know, the more fearful and distrustful they become. Now, we live in an information society, but ironically, it seems that the breadth and depth of our knowledge is actually shrinking, and our intellectual comfort zones are drastically compartmentalized, and often there seems to be more disinformation than truth. Now, the most powerful antidote to ignorance and intolerance is knowledge, and it's even rarer cousin wisdom, and the best way to achieve that is to read. If we can wipe out ignorance and intolerance and almost all the problems we face as a nation, from poverty to prejudice, crime to health care, the economy to civility, yes, I put civility in there because I think we can all agree that we're shockingly lacking in that these days, will be largely solved. You know, 70% of inmates, well over half the people on public assistance, and virtually all those who practice prejudice in their lives share one common element. They're all illiterate. The economic impact is stark. The cost of adult illiteracy in the United States, attributable to lost revenues, tax collections, and social costs, are over $1 trillion per year. Even for us, standing in the, in the capital of this great country, even for us, $1 trillion is a big, big number. In a world of high public debt, the government, in effect, subsidizes companies who pay lower minimum wages, which go overwhelmingly to people with low skills and low reading abilities, because the majority of those folks are on public assistance because they can't survive solely on their salaries. Folks whose job it is to predict the number of prison beds required in the future look at things like spending on food assistance, education and health care, pre-K programs, and fourth grade reading results because those, the nexus between those factors and crime is so accurate. When spending on those items go down, crime goes up. The high school dropout rate is the most effective tool in predicting future prison bed needs because three quarters of all inmates are dropouts. And a dropout is three and a half more times likely to be arrested than someone who graduated from high school. Now with a million dropouts a year, you can see that the future prison population in this country will be booming for quite some time. And it costs on average $25,000 to $50,000 a year to house an inmate. That's college tuition. The conclusion drawn from this may well be that, you know, we can either pay for pre-K or we can pay for prison. And with over 20% of all American kids growing up in poverty and almost half growing up in low-income families, you can well see how great the need is for all of us. Ignorance and intolerance have terrible consequences beyond simply economics and crime. I grew up in the South in the 60s and 70s. It was a small, insular world. It was still heavily, heavily segregated. It would have been too easy to just never see outside of those blinders and accept society and the world not only as the way it was for me, but the way it, it should be, even more insidiously, the way it should be. But through books, even though I never really left my hometown growing up, I saw a universe full of people who didn't look like me, cultures that gazed at the world differently, and I was exposed to solutions to problems that I know would never be popular where and when I grew up, but were still worthy and viable nonetheless. Now, studies routinely show that people who read fiction, you know, narratives that are imagined by their creator, but which still have an unbreakable tether to the real world, with all of its triumphs and all of its foibles, are far more open-minded and tolerant and accepting of both people and ideas that are different. They're more curious, more willing to move outside their comfort zones to allow their own ideas to be challenged and their minds changed, or to change others' minds through reasoned debate 
rather than by vitriol. We don't need more screamers in society. We have plenty of them already. We need more readers in our society. Now today we gather in what I believe is the greatest library on earth. You know, the building named after a man, Thomas Jefferson, who once famously proclaimed that he could not live without books. Now as a man who authored the Declaration of Independence, he well knew the connection between education, books, and real freedom. The first thing that dictators do when they take over a country, they don't kill all the lawyers for Mr. Shakespeare. That might be step two for all I know. They close all the libraries. It's the first thing they do. They close all the libraries. Why? Because those places are filled with books that are in turn filled with ideas and differences of opinion. And that is the last thing a myopic dictatorship wants oppressed people exposed to. They might just start thinking. And that's really all you need to know about the nexus between true liberty and books. It's not, it's not a purity of opinion that counts for a democracy to flourish. It's diversity of ideas. It always has been. And it can literally change the world. I mean, it's said that teaching one girl in Afghanistan to read is the most cost-efficient way to change the entire culture of a country and put it on the right path to becoming a productive member of the world community. How is that for a return on investment? We're leaving many problems for future generations by our actions today, no doubt. Now, one gift we can leave them is the touchstone skill to read and with it, the ability to think, thus empowering them with the one true tool they would need to unlock every ounce of potential they have. It certainly takes a village and an effective government and a strong private sector to make a society vibrant, fair, and productive. But the catalyst for all of that is the ability to read and letting people take that skill forward in their lives, allowing all the positive results to flow from that one initial endeavor, affecting not only them, but all whom they encounter along the way. We will see that individual congregate as a family, a small group, and then build into a village, a town, a city, a state, a region, a nation, and then grow beyond even our borders, making the entire world a more stable, positive place. We know how it works. We know what needs to be done. We just have to get there. There could be no higher purpose as a nation. It literally constitutes our future. I thank you, and I wish you well. Well, David, thank you once again for sharing your insights of your humor, of your love of books, your love of Jane Austen uh, with us today. It was a very personal uh, account of things and fits in beautifully with what we're trying to accomplish. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.